accept attendance. This is a seminar and a put in. This is simply kind of simply a form of introduction. I will give a short introduction about myself one more time, and then I will discuss the five theoretical views of environmental sociology. Then we'll look at some early examples of environmental sociology from the 1970s. Then we have a short film dealing with an interscientific topic, plastic pollution in the ocean. Um, there's two short films. One of them will have Korean subtitles. Uh, and then we'll look at macro theories about the environment and social relations. Macro theories will be, of course, grand global ideas about the relationships of the environment and
I will not repeat those issues. But remember that we're talking about how to understand phenomena in the world, not as only social, but as biological and physical. A good example would be agricultural policy. You know, that's a social issue. But it will have biological effects. It may actually change pollution levels in the water. You may actually know that you want to change pollution levels in the water. And so how do you research this intersection? And I argue that environmental sociology has always tried to find out how to develop good methods to discuss this intersection. So came out of observations, the 1960s and 1970s environmental movement. Particularly, this book, this book, Silent Spring. How many of you have heard of this book? This book is probably translated into many, many languages by now. This was published in 1962. It was a huge critique, a social critique, of the pollution from choices of pesticides, herbicides, in agriculture that came out of the war economy of World War II and then conducted war upon agriculture to kill bugs. But it killed more than bugs, it killed people, it damaged uh, genetics, it would kill birds, and that's the origin of the metaphor in the title. Silent Spring was a potential future where there are no birds that sing because birds were dying as much as the insects and other pests that were trying to kill. So this was a huge critique of choices that society or corporations had made to kill bugs. And um, from this, the environmental movement began to grow in importance, particularly in the United States. The first Earth Day was 1970. And sociologists, sociologists originally looked at the environmental movement as a social belief. Well, we analyze it like other social things. We just ask them about beliefs, and we analyze it as if it's only a social issue. But some sociologist says, no, we can't do that. To be honest with this, we need to address the interaction, what I call hybridity. It's a hybrid issue. And I would argue there is no sociology. That there are all hybrid issues. Uh, last time I also put up a drawing like this, you know, where we had you know, sociology, this is environmental sociology. You might argue sociology is a small section of this interaction. It's a discipline, a discipline which has limited our vision. We only see the world through the social lens when we should see it as an interaction. I mean, we breathe air every day. Obviously, everybody is following very closely the radiation coming from Japan right now which is now mm, 90 miles away from the Fukushima Daiichi plant. Uh, it's found in spinach. It's found in the social flow of water. It's in tap water in Tokyo. There are thousands of people leaving the place um, right now. They don't want to go outside. It's found in spinach already. And um, you know, many countries are saying, we're going to monitor this biological flow around the world. So, Radiation pollution is a very hybrid issue. People chose that. It's not a natural thing. I mean, this is coming out of social choices. So once you begin to open this box and analyze everything as hybrid, it will change your viewpoint about sociology, I think, entirely. To realize your previous analysis may have been very limiting. You know, one, one eye, your version of social analysis. In the beginning, as, a, as such, environmental sociology was meant to be a reformation of sociology aiming to take social and environmental interactions seriously as the basis, not just as a small part, but as the basis of sociology. However, it's still a rare specialty, particularly in Korea. It's still very rare in the United States, despite uh, my choice of going to a department that had a lot of environmental sociologists. Um, currently, environmental sociology is expanding in a lot of scale and visibility. The past two meetings of the International Sociological Association 
had huge amounts of environmental sociologists. And the most recent one, in 2010 in Sweden, where I was actually last summer, um, one of its main themes was an environmental theme, sustainability. That's the first time any environmental topic has been connected to the International Association. Uh, there was also so much research that there was another two days before the program. So this is, this is a big area of expansion in social analysis. As I said, it came out of observations in the 1960s and 70s, environmental movements, the lack of satisfaction of many sociologists in analyzing it simply as a phenomenon of belief. You could do that, and I think that's important to do. I am not denying that. And people who are environmental sociologists follow the belief patterns of people about the environment. That's hybrid issue. But a lot of the people wanted to do more than just that. They wanted to analyze physical flows of materials through society and through our bodies. And they felt the history of only looking at social facts, that was Durkheim's idea of sociology, social facts can be explained only by other social facts. That's Durkheim's closed world about social analysis. So instead of a subdivision, it was designed to be a wider reformation, as I said take into account social and environmental interactions seriously as the basis for analysis. In the past 35 years, environmental sociology has developed at least five major theoretical viewpoints. And over our short class of seven sessions, meeting every two weeks, we will discuss these five. Today, we'll talk about macro theory, as I said, uh, to introduce the general topic. So far, this is without theoretical closure. There's a lot of conflict. You have environmental sociologists that believe in one kind of analysis and others that do not. So there's still a lot of conflict within environmental sociology. But I like to merge them together myself. And optimistically, I think they don't have to be exclusive in their analysis. It's the people that are very exclusive in their analysis. So in temporal order, these five versions First one, beginning in the 1960s. You probably know this from the mass media. And, and many large corporations and states argue and they construct environmental problems as an issue of population. And this is called Malthusianism. Originally populated, uh, popular, huh, Freudian slip. Originally popularized by huge corporations in the British Empire in the 1800s by Thomas uh, Malthus, Reverend Malthus, who worked for the British East India Company. And his idea was that problems of people dying in India within the British Empire was their own fault. There's just too many people. Notice there's no environmental connection to this. He's simply arguing that people cannot be supported because, he argues, agriculture doesn't develop fast enough. And people, he argued, are too stupid when they're poor and they greed too much. So in a class analysis, there's people who are Marxists who analyze this discourse as well, uh, critiqued by David Harvey. And he argues Malthus is really arguing of a class analysis because his solutions were the poor are to blame for environmental problems as well as their own destruction. And the rich should be given more wealth because they can handle it, and wealth makes people more disciplined to take care of their property. This was a major theory that was expanded in 1968 by a famous journal article in Nature. This was the tragedy of the commons. You might have heard of the tragedy of the commons. This was an application of uh, arguing that people's self-interests, because they're selfish, they don't take care of common property. And the person who argued for this is named Hardin, H-A-R-D-I-N, 